and civilization. The story of mankind cannot be divorced from the history of war. War and civilization looks at man's achievements over 5,000 years. What he has created, what he has destroyed, and asks, can there be a future without war? John Keegan is one of the best known and most distinguished military historians of our century. He has spent a lifetime studying war, why men fight, how men fight. He has ranged across the globe and through history searching for the answers. War is an activity probably about 5,000 years old in, in man's life on Earth. Originally, not a particularly destructive or lethal activity and not very wide-ranging in its effects. It's become, over five millennia, or became, at the beginning of this century, uh, an activity that threatened actually to bring civilization to an end. I think that's what Hiroshima threatened, and man stared more or less universal destruction in the face. War is collective killing for a collective purpose. I don't think that you can produce any more refined or elaborate definition. The skills for this sort of killing have come from man's ability to hunt animals in groups. Men learn to combine for lethal purposes through hunting. And they also learn to accept leadership because hunting man seemed to work better if somebody's in charge. And this translates into war where men cooperate under a leader to kill other men. When cave dwellers became farmers and created settled communities, they became vulnerable. Nomadic raiders saw their crops, their tools, their livestock, their women, and tried to take them. The origins of war lie in theft. War began when hunters discovered that settled peoples were easy meat, were, were a form of prey themselves. And they had things that were valuable. The settled people started to try and defend themselves. At first, perhaps, simply by fortification, by making refuges which raiders couldn't penetrate. As villages grew into cities, cities into states, and states into empires, conquest led man into battle. The history of empires is written in blood. But when early empires overreached themselves, they learned harsh lessons from barbarians at their borders. As man embraced the idea of religion, he took up the sword. Countless wars have been fought in the name of one true God, of Islam, of Christianity. When the power of a political ideal gripped a people, revolution led them to overthrow their rulers. And when one political creed faced off against another, the world faced Armageddon. This is one of the last places on Earth where wars are fought as they were in the beginning. In the beginning, warfare was simple. Eyeball to eyeball, one group of men armed with primitive weapons squared off. They exchanged insults, and then they fought hand to hand. They stopped when first blood was drawn. 
Early war was non-lethal, inconclusive, indecisive. 2,500 years ago, the ancient Greeks transformed war into what we know today. The Greeks would develop a new style of war, which was formal, decisive, and deadly. The Western way of war. This is the first modern soldier, a hoplite. He appeared in Greece almost 3,000 years ago. 800 years before Christ, hoplites invented a way of fighting that survives to this day. A way of fighting that has become the Western way of war. The hoplite story begins on the mainland of ancient Greece. For hundreds of years, villages fought and squabbled among themselves. As they fought, they formed alliances. And as they formed alliances, the villages grew into bigger communities called city-states. The city-states of Greece included Sparta, Corinth, Thebes, and the most famous and influential of all, Athens. The citizens of these city-states were free men who created a vibrant culture of markets, political life, religion, and philosophy. All of this was possible because they were farmers. The Greeks were a settled agricultural society based on the idea of private property. They owned small holdings of between five and 15 acres, and they earned their living from growing fruit, cereals, and rearing sheep. And they were successful. It was the surplus of crops and food that enabled their culture to develop. When threatened, the farmers would band together and fight to protect their property and their way of life. Their most common enemy was a neighboring city-state. Although the city-states shared a common culture, they often quarreled. Almost every year, arguments arose over land. There would be a boundary dispute, and then there would be battle. And a very special style of warfare developed from these local quarrels. We should remember they're small communities, so they're gonna have inevitably border disputes, but they have to devise a method that allows it to be decisive and quick and allows these farmers to get back to their own farms without anybody getting annihilated. And that's what hoplite warfare does. The main goal of ancient Greek warfare was to be quick and decisive. And that has been the aim of Western military commanders ever since. The weight of hoplite arms and armor, coupled with the heat of the Greek summer, meant battles were short. Because both sides had to get back to their crops, battles needed to be decisive. On the day of battle, the hoplite would get up early to prepare his equipment. Often, fathers and sons would fight side by side. Most hoplites had a servant to help prepare for battle. The hoplite soldiers of Greece were people who wore heavy armor, and the word hoplite itself derives from the word hopla, which means gear. They had a rather cumbersome helmet that didn't have a lot of openings for sight or hearing, 
and we know that they had a breastplate of 35 pounds and it would be solid plate at least in the first century or two of their appearance. They had greaves, they had a small secondary sword, but most importantly this enormous three-foot wooden shield out of hardwood, perhaps oak, and the entire ensemble may have weighed in at about 70 pounds. Ever since the days of the hoplites, soldiers have carried, on average, 70 pounds of equipment into battle. Even today, modern combat troops carry a pack and rifle weighing about 70 pounds. Like generations before them, commanders take critical decisions about how that 70 pounds is made up. Armor versus weapons versus provisions. The more provisions a soldier carries, the longer he can march and fight. But more provisions means fewer weapons, lighter armor, and a soldier who is less deadly in battle. Packing for war always has been a life and death decision. The hoplite chose heavy armor, few provisions, and heavy lethal weapons. Hoplite warrior, I think, would be a terrifying thing to look at. He would have not only his armor from his neck to his waist, he'd have greaves on his shin, he'd have this enormous shield and some type of insignia, which could be horrific in itself. It would have this crest that would bob back and forth, what we see in the Iliad that frightens small children. With weapons and armor at the ready, the hoplites formed a long line, several men deep, a phalanx. Actually, as an individual fighter, it's true a hoplite would probably be quite vulnerable because his shield is round and it would probably not protect his entire body well. Also, his sword is very short, it's a secondary weapon. You take that soldier and you put him in a line perhaps a half a mile long and eight men deep, and then those disadvantages become advantages, and his shield protects people. He wears it on the left, it protects person on his left, he seeks protection on the man on his right. Ranks one, two, and three, their spears reach the enemy, and nobody can go through that, that line of pikes. It's like no other uh, formation. In Greek, the word phalanx means roller, in a hoplite battle, the key to victory was to keep the phalanx rolling. A phalanx that kept moving forward stood a good chance of victory. If it stopped or broke ranks, its soldiers were doomed. The hoplites had a simple strategy for keeping a phalanx together. In the front row were middle-aged, battle-hardened soldiers. Behind them were the youngest, least experienced men. And at the rear, the oldest battle-hardened veterans kept the young ones moving forwards, at sword point if necessary. The style of warfare dictated the battlefield. For the phalanx to keep its shape, hoplites had to fight on level ground. And since the Greek way of war was governed by rules, the battlefield was agreed on in advance. Where the battle is fought is kind of ironic because usually the disputes arise not over flat, good farmland, but over borderland that's rough and is used for grazing that typically separates one Greek city-state from another. So I think what we could imagine the course of events would be something like the following. Somebody comes down from the foothills and says, the Thebans have encroached on our land. There's an assembly of Athenians. They decide that this is one time too many. They march over the pass. They take two or three days rations in their knapsack. The Thebans know they're coming. They get to a first flat plain across the border. see each other, the musters of hoplites are complete. Each man would arrange a 
in their preset place in the phalanx. They would look at the enemy. Sometimes they might look at the enemy for 10 minutes and charge. Sometimes it might be a half an hour we hear it. In some cases it might be an hour. It's the type of warfare like none other in the world where people consciously must think what's going to happen to them in the next 10, 15, 20 minutes. There's no skirmishing. There's no guerrilla tactics. There's no night tactics. Chance is pretty well out of the picture. The chance is simply how tough you are and how willing you are to stand your ground. battle, the rules of war ensured a fair fight. Each side set heralds to make sure the rules were observed and to agree on who had won. The ancient poet Homer described the tense moments before battle. They made a living fence, spear to spear, shield to shield, helmet to helmet, and man to man. The spears they brandished in their strong hands were interlaced, and their hearts were set on battle. Thrusting shield against shield, they shoved and fought and killed and fell. There was no shouting, nor was there silence, but the strange noise that wrath and battle together will produce. Inside the phalanx, a swirl of dust, blood, and twisting bodies blinded the hoplite. His helmet muffled all sound. He could react only to the press of men about him. Sometimes brother killed brother. Being thus pressed and crowded together, he who had either drawn his sword or directed his lance could neither restore it again, nor put his sword up. With these weapons, they wounded their own men as they happened to come in the way, and they were dying by mere contact with each other. One side broke through an opponent's phalanx. The end was swift. Those who turned and fled were cut down from behind. This violent, deadly, decisive way of fighting still affect how wars are fought today. The citizens of Athens, Thebes, and Sparta fought each other constantly. But when they were threatened by outsiders, they would bury their differences, join forces, and march off to fight their common foe. In 490 BC, that foe was the greatest empire on earth, Persia. The shipping lanes of the Aegean Sea 
are all that separate Greece from her worst enemy in the 5th century BC. The Persian Empire, the mightiest in the world, is angered by constant Greek attacks on its coast. Persia is vast, as big as the United States. Greece is no bigger than New York State. Persia decides to teach the Greeks a lesson. As her mighty forces set sail, the Greek way of war is about to be tested. In the greatest sea battle of the ancient world, the Greeks use their custom-made fighting ship, the Trireme. But first, the Greeks and Persians will fight on land. In 490 BC, an army of 25,000 Persians landed at the Bay of Marathon, confident of victory. Eleven thousand hoplites had left Athens to do battle at Marathon. While the city was undefended, a Persian fleet approached Athens. The toughest troops in Greece, the Spartans, refused to help their Athenian neighbors. Panic gripped the city. The Athenian phalanx must win at Marathon and win quickly. The security of Athens is at stake. The hoplites stared at the Persians a mile away across the plain. Then they broke into a run. The Persians thought it suicidal madness. The assault was so brutal, it carried the day. 6,400 Persians lay dead. But Athens was still at risk. The Persian navy was still closing on Athens. A message to resist at all costs had to get through to the city. But Athens and Marathon are 26 miles apart. The Greeks sent for the only man who might get there in time a runner named Pheidippides. Pheidippides set off on his legendary run, the very first marathon. As he delivered his message, he died of exhaustion. But he didn't die in vain. Athens took heart and held on until the army of Marathon returned. When the Persians saw them, they turned and fled. In this first great clash between East and West, between Persians and Greeks, the Greek way of war triumphed. Decisive action won the day. In thanksgiving for victory, the Athenians built the magnificent treasury at Delphi. Ten years after Marathon, Persia launched a second invasion. A Greek oracle foretold the wooden wall alone shall not fall. The Athenian commander, Themistocles, interpreted wooden wall to mean ships, fighting ships. The Athenians built a fleet of state-of-the-art fighting ships called triremes. Trireme was the fastest ship afloat. Powered by 170 oarsmen, it had a top speed of 11 knots, or 12 and a half miles per hour. Its 
main weapon was a giant timber cased in bronze that projected from the prow. With this, the trireme would simply ram any ship that got in its way. The fleet of triremes was completed just in time. In 480 BC, the Persian emperor Xerxes approached Greece with the biggest army and navy yet assembled, 200,000 men. In a two-pronged attack, the Persian army attacked Greece from the north, while its fleet approached Athens near the island of Salamis. As the Persian troops marched south, they found their way barred by 7,000 hoplites at Thermopylae, a narrow pass that was the key to Greece. At the core of the hoplite force were 300 of the most feared and disciplined troops in all Greece, the Spartans. Their king, Leonidas, was in command. A Persian was sent on horseback to observe what the troops were doing. Some of them were stripped for exercise, while others were combing their hair. No one attempted to catch him or took the least notice of him. The spy watched them in astonishment and reported back. The Persian generals laughed at the Greeks with their absurd notions of warfare. Their very presence seemed mere impudent and reckless folly. Enraged by the calm of the Spartans, the Persian commander threw his army against them. The Persian attack against Leonidas lasted four days. The Spartans fought until their swords broke and then fought on with their hands and teeth until Leonidas and every one of his men lay dead. As Xerxes and his Persian army marched on Athens, the Athenians put their faith in their wooden wall and withdrew to the island of Salamis. <laughs> then, as now, Salamis was a thriving port. Where these vessels lie peacefully at anchor, 800 Persian warships assembled for battle. On the morning of September 23rd, 480 BC, Xerxes, Persian emperor, king of kings, sat on a golden throne atop a hill just west of Athens. Beneath him sparkled the narrow straits of Salamis. He confidently watched his mighty fleet, sure of victory. But Themistocles, commander of the Athenian fleet, was well prepared. Outnumbered two to one, he planned to draw the Persians into the narrow waters where their huge fleet could not maneuver. Themistocles held back his triremes in the Straits of Salamis, daring the Persians to attack. Persians took the bait and sailed into the narrows. Themistocles gave the order and the Athenians rode hard toward the Persians. Each captain steered his craft straight on one another. The whole force went down broken when ship rammed ship. With splintered ships now locked together, the top decks became a battleground where the Greeks fought the Persians in bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat. They might have been tuna or netted fish. Shores and reefs filled up with our dead.
for they kept on spearing and gutting us with splintered oars and bits of wreckage, while moaning and screams drowned out the sea noise, till night's black face closed it all in. In an eerie echo of the past, the hulks of modern steel ships rest rotting where the wrecks of the Persian fleet lay splintered two and a half thousand years ago. The Greek tactic of decisive engagement on carefully chosen ground had worked on land at Marathon. At Salamis, it worked at sea. The Greek way of war was poised to take over the world. This face has not been seen since before the birth of Christ. A deep wound slices down from the forehead, through the eye, and into the cheek. Reconstruction of the face began with this ancient skull. Medical artist Richard Neve used forensic techniques for identifying modern-day murder victims from fragments of their skulls. This skull comes from an ancient burial site in northern Greece. A tomb on the site contained a 2,000-year-old skull and a skeleton archaeologists believed was that of Philip of Macedon, one of the ancient world's greatest commanders. The main clue was a nick in the bone over the right eye. We know that Philip II was wounded in the right eye by an arrow. Here we can see the relationship of the damage to the upper border of the eye socket here and uh, the, the, the cheekbone here. And one can think of a barbed arrow coming down from above it's going to come crashing down here, damage the bone, tear the, across the eyeball, and then fractured the cheekbone here. Quite clearly, with an injury like that, that man is going to be blind in that eye. So that is the first sort of uh, important thing that one can see when you reassemble all these pieces of the bone. The evidence fits a description of Philip losing an eye to a stray arrow during a siege. The account says, Philip accepted the loss of an eye in exchange for domination and power. Philip's quest for power began in Macedonia, a wild barbarian kingdom north of the Greek city-states. Over 20 years, Philip developed a new type of army. He understood the power of the Greek pike square, or phalanx, and placed it at the heart of his own army. Philip was one of the shrewdest military organizers in history. He didn't just borrow the phalanx, he took it one step further. To do so, he looked to the rolling hills of Macedonia. The nobles of the north were exceptional horsemen. Philip took these men and turned them into cavalry. island of Crete, he recruited fierce tribesmen, famous for their expertise as archers. He added specialist warriors whose skill with javelin and sling could disrupt enemy formations as they assembled for battle. Putting these units together, Philip created an army that was far more flexible than any of the Greek city-states had mustered. But above all, Philip increased the deadliness of the phalanx. The balance between arms and armor was tipped heavily toward arms. Philip reduced the size of shields. He lengthened the spear, or sarissa, from eight feet to 14. With its spears lowered for battle, the lethal points of the first five ranks extended beyond the front of the phalanx. 
In battle, an enemy soldier would find 10 spearheads coming at him. Once it was moving with rank upon rank of pikemen pressing each other forward, the phalanx developed an unstoppable momentum. Anything that got in its way faced wall after wall of sharp thrusting iron. Macedonian phalanx skewered its enemy like pieces of meat. The hardest part of battle was to keep its spearheads free of enemy dead. Philip revolutionized warfare not only because of the way he taught his troops to fight, he also paid them and trained them all year round. Unlike their Greek neighbors, Philip's army campaigned in all seasons. They could march 20 to 30 miles a day with their heavy equipment. No other army could match them. This was a professional army, a permanent standing army. Philip's army was unstoppable. In 20 years of campaigning, he defeated the tribes of Thessaly and Thrace, conquered much of the Balkans, northern Greece, and the European parts of modern Turkey. But the great prize lay to the south. Philip wanted the rich, old city-states of Greece. He marched south through the pass of Thermopylae. On the flat plain of Chironia, in the heart of Greece, a hoplite army stood in his way. Philip's new army, was to meet the best of the old. Fighting at Philip's side was a promising young commander, his son, Alexander. <laughs> 338 BC, the Battle of Chironia. Across this plain, 50,000 Athenians and Thebans faced Philip's Macedonian army of 32,000. The fate of all Greece hung on the outcome. On the left flank, Philip's son Alexander commanded the cavalry. Only 18 years old, Alexander had his eye on his father's throne. Thebans advanced, led by their elite force, the Sacred Band, a unit of 300 homosexual lovers sworn to fight to the death. Philip ordered his phalanx to roll forward. the Athenians forward until a gap opened between them and the Thebans. 
Alexander gave the order. A single headlong cavalry charge broke the enemy line. With 6,000 dead, the Athenians turned and ran for their lives. The Thebans lost 20,000. The sacred band was destroyed to a man. True to their word, the sacred band had fought side by side to the death. Philip so admired their courage that he approved a monument to commemorate their sacrifice. With victory at Chironia, Philip was ruler of Greece, but just two years later, he was dead, assassinated. Alexander inherited the throne of Greece and with it his father's most ambitious dream, to destroy Persia. With his new Macedonian army, he had the means to achieve it. At the heart of Alexander's army was the Companion Cavalry. Its officers lived together as brothers, sharing risks and competing against each other in courage and military daring. Courage was something Alexander possessed in abundance. He led from the front. In his merciless treatment of the Thebans, Philip's son, Alexander, showed what would become his hallmark, total annihilation of the enemy. He was a ruthless person who would kill his close friends if the, if the mood took him. He was also very contemptuous of his own safety if he felt it necessary to risk his life. Nine times wounded, once the last time almost to death. Uh, he, he, he was not a person to go drinking with on a Saturday night, literally, because uh, of course, it was all at a drinking session that he did kill his, one of his closest friends, Cleistus, by thrusting a spear through his chest because uh, Cleistus had said something he didn't like. Over three years, from 334 to 331 BC, Alexander beat the Persian army at Granicus, Issus, and finally at Arbella in modern Iraq. Alexander, master of Greece, was now a ruler of Asia Minor, Egypt, and Syria. Ahead of him lay an epic campaign of conquest which would take him to Afghanistan and India, far beyond the boundaries of the known world. To this day, no other warlord has conquered an area larger than the empire of Alexander in so short a time. And throughout his reign, the core of Alexander's army came from his homeland of Macedonia. No one had ever tackled the problem of feeding and supplying an army so far from home. Alexander's genius was to be both a great fighter and the father of modern logistics. He kept his army close to the coast, supplying them from a flotilla of ships that followed the army's advance. Once supplied, Alexander's men had to carry their own provisions. If Alexander caught them using ox carts to carry food or equipment, he would burn the cart and slaughter the ox. An ox could only pull enough supplies to feed itself for eight days, let alone carry food for his army. In Alexander's time, he was driven to a certain extent by the availability of uh, logistic support, whether water, whether grain, whether forage, whatever it was, in the direction in which he went. Now, to take an example, 
There was some question as to which route he was going to take. Would he go down the Euphrates Valley or would he go along the north? And for logistic reasons, he went across the top and then down the eastern side of the Tigris River. The reason was that the grass was growing along the northern side where it was a bit higher and a bit cooler and therefore grass didn't burn off. Uh, and also the grain there was in undefended villages which he could get rather than the Euphrates Valley where there was no grass because it burned off during the summer and all the grain was in defended locations. That is, I think, an example where logistic considerations drove an operational decision. Nothing has changed. No matter how good an army is, it can't operate without arms, equipment, and food. Preparations for the Allied invasion of Normandy in World War II went on for months. When the time came to fight, it was the last and shortest stage of an enormous logistical operation. The weapons of war have changed, but the lessons of Alexander's campaign in Persia remain valid today. When forced away from the coast and his supply dumps, Alexander followed rivers for fresh water. He often sent messengers ahead with bribes and promises of clemency for those who would provision his troops. As he marched his troops farther from home than any army before, logistics and supply became a matter of life and death. The arithmetic is simple. If 100,000 men run out of food, 100,000 die. Nowhere is managing supplies more crucial than during a siege. A besieging army is static. Local food sources soon run out. Thermosos in Asia Minor sits high on a mountain peak. The only approach is through narrow passes that are easily defended. Alexander came upon the city during his journey through Anatolia. He didn't like what he saw. The city was isolated. Alexander knew its supplies would eventually run out. But at high altitude and in difficult terrain, so would his. The gain would not match the investment. Wisely, he withdrew. Ten years after he abandoned the siege at Termosus, Alexander's empire covered virtually all the known world. A lesser commander might have lost everything at the very start in a hopeless assault on Termosus. Alexander was one of the boldest generals in history and one of the shrewdest. In the entire history of warfare, no man has matched the achievements of Alexander the Great. For more than 2,000 years, his legend has obsessed the greatest generals. Julius Caesar wept because he couldn't match Alexander's conquests. Napoleon thought you couldn't understand war without studying Alexander. Even Adolf Hitler professed his admiration for the king of Macedonia. At 33, Alexander was dead, and his name passed into legend. In his short, brilliant life, Alexander took his army further east than any European army would travel until the age of gunpowder. But he had never been west. There, the next great power would emerge. 